whole thing without hesitating. That when the Wright brothers sat down to do what they were doing, they were clearly challenging the edict of stick to your knitting and only knew what's been done before. That when they set out to build their plane, they were doing the opposite of what the powers that be would have you do. And so when we think about the people who have made shifts in our world, it's not people who have followed the edict that we got in school to do what we're told. That the reason we invented public school was to train millions of people to be compliant enough to go to work and do what they were told. Because industrialists needed that. There was a shortage of compliant workers and we built the school system to make it happen. So back to prehistory here. For a million years, the way we fed ourselves was we hunted. That was the only way to survive. Then, just in time, 10,000 years ago, we invented farming. And farming worked for a long time, until only 150 years ago when we invented the job. And the job is a brand new concept, right? Your mother-in-law would like you to think that everyone has had a job for all time, but it is not true. And so if you wanted to be a coal miner in West Virginia, you grew up not saying, I'm going to build a coal mine. You grew up saying, how do I get a job in a coal mine? Here's the thing. Until 150 years ago, the unemployment rate in the world was zero. There was zero percent unemployment because there were zero jobs. And we can go back to zero percent unemployment once we understand that in the connection economy, you may end up working for someone. But if you're going to have a good job, you're not going to have a job, you're going to be doing what I call art. Now, I need to take a minute here because this word is really misunderstood because I'm not using it the way everyone else does. So let me try it. A hundred years ago today, or this month, Marcel Duchamp put this painting into the, into the show at the um, armory in New York City. And of course, it's called Nude Descending the Staircase. And the title of it completely freaked people out. Uh, former President Teddy Roosevelt wrote an op-ed page specifically calling out this painting by name and decrying it. And for a while, it was the most important and most discussed painting in the world. Now, the thing about this painting that made it art isn't that it's an actual photographic representation of a nude descending staircase. In fact, what makes it art, what makes art art almost all the time is the act and the leap and the humanity of someone stepping forward who says, this might not work, this is ridiculous, here, I made this. So when a human being, when Jackson Pollock does this, it's not a particular method. Forging a Pollock isn't that hard. But here's a fascinating look at Charles Pollock, his brother, drawing at exactly, exactly the same time. You can't criticize the work of Charles Pollock, right? Because he was just doing what his teacher taught him to do. But art, the brave thing we call art, is about someone jumping up, stepping up, standing up, and saying, this is me, this is what I'm making. So Joseph Boyce does art with felt, and Bill Shakespeare does art with words. Back to Marcel Duchamp, he put this urinal into an art exhibit, and it was a sensation. The second guy to install a urinal into a museum was a plumber, <laughs> and that's the difference, right? But the difference is that what you have to do to be an artist, as Robert Irwin says, is forget the name of what you're seeing. Learn to see the world differently. Embrace this blank slate with whatever tool set you have, right? And then make something that's worth connecting to. Even though it's so cheap to fail, this is a real book. <laughs> like, just screw up until you figure it out. They're invisible sheep. But no. And the reason is because we have pushed people to be competent. That being competent is how you get good grades in third grade, and fifth grade, and twelfth grade, and as a junior in college. It's all about being competent. At the uh, Juilliard School, where I spoke a couple years ago, they told me that they don't have guest speakers very often, because they invited a famous violinist to come. They had the auditorium about this big, and only 15 people came. And yet, every practice room was filled. Here was somebody who had trod the path that they wanted to go down. Here was someone who could teach them about the emotions of what it was going to take to succeed. 
but everyone in the school was more concerned about playing the notes as written. Here's the thing. If you can write down what you need done, someone can do it cheaper. The industrial age is doomed because we've made it so easy to make things cheap. You cannot charge a premium whether you're a wedding photographer or an architect if all you're doing is a job that can be written down in advance. So let me talk about the, the marketing tactic here and the, the, the structure of the industry that we're going to. In the same era of industrialization, the best friend of industrialization was mass marketing. TV ads for the masses. Because if you're running a factory and it's going at full speed and you're really efficient, you love the fact that you can put ads on TV that sell all the same stuff to everyone. And so the middle, the square of the normal distribution. Who are these people? The normal people. Right? That's why it's called the normal distribution. And your job as someone who makes anything was to make stuff for the big, fat, juicy middle. Because if you're going to interrupt everyone, you better have something everyone wants to buy. But 20 years ago, it started to stretch. It started to melt. That bit by bit by bit, by connecting the outliers, we have made it so that there are now more people on the outside, more weird people, than there are normal people. And here's how the math works. Let's say uh, you get two or three tattoos. You think you're a real hipster. But you go to the East Village and you look around and you realize you need 18 more tattoos to catch up. <coughs> or you get into fly fishing. So you go to Dick's Sporting Goods, mass merchant. They have three fly fishing rods. Good, better, best. You're a big spender, you buy best. That would be the end of it. But now, thanks to the internet, you go to flyfishingrs.com and they have 400 fly fishing rods and you need the left-handed one made by monks for people who are only fishing in this zip code, right? <laughs> and so what we're doing is if you care about something, we have pushed you to the edges and it enables us to find each other. Look around. You all found each other. There were no mass marketing ads for this event today. You have more in common with the people in this room than almost anyone you will ever meet. And it would have been impossible for me to connect you just 10 years ago. The Red Hat ladies, all connected by the, now, by the old days just by a newspaper article, but now they can find each other. These Red Hat guys, they pay $10,000 to go to Hawaii to compete in the Ironman triathlon. They don't even like the swimming park. <laughs> like, what is it? They don't have water where they live? That they have to go this far? No. They go because the other people who do it are there. Or the Portland Santa Claus Club. I love these guys. <laughs> They trained all year round for last week. And they found each other and they connect with each other because they care. And this one, which I just discovered, the world's largest assemblage of Smurf impersonators. Right? Or, you know, these guys who need to get some other form of a life. The point is, Star Trek conventions showed us how much we care about being connected. How much it matters that the people around us are around us and are on the same path. Let me show you how this feels. Follow these instructions under the time loop. Go. Okay, stop. That was as good as I expected. Four seconds. A New York City record. How did you know at which rhythm to clap? I didn't make eye contact. No one stood up and said, you know, Nikki didn't say, everyone, follow me. You all did it in four seconds. Some groups clap fast, some groups clap slow. You figured it out. Human beings like doing that. We like doing what other people are doing. It is not an accident that we can organize people into tribes. If we find people, a group of people, and we commit to them, and we create a culture for them, and we connect them to one another, and we are clear with them and challenge them to go somewhere, they want to follow us. They want to be in sync. Nike invented the long distance runner. He wasn't, she wasn't around before Nike spent the time and money to do it. But now that they're in sync, they look the same, they talk the same, they wear the same outfits, because we want to. We want to be part of this culture. The Beatles did not invent teenagers. They just showed up to lead them. Bob Marley did not invent the Rastafarians. He just showed up to lead them. But what's fascinating now, this moment in time, which isn't going to be here forever, this revolution, is that all of these tribes are exposed now 
We can find each other. If you have a $99 laptop with a Wi-Fi card, there's a billion people who could connect with you if they chose to. We are saying to you, raise your hand. We're saying, here's a microphone. If you want to sing, sing. If you want to dance, dance. If you want to write, write. If you want to lead a civil rights movement, go ahead and do so. And people aren't taking the microphone because they're waiting for a dummy stuff. They're waiting for a boss. They're waiting for an organization to get a act together. So the giant difference between the posture of Dell computer 15 years ago and the posture of Apple computer 15 years ago is simple. Dell said, what is the massiest, most normal, cheapest thing we can make, and how can we make more of it? And Apple said, let's do the opposite. Whatever they're doing, let's not do that. Those are the choices. That's the fork in the road. And the reason it's hard, which is where I started, is this. If you are working with an organization, if you have created a financial structure for your own freelance work, whatever it is, and you say, this is all fine, but it's so important failure is not an option, then what you have also announced is neither is success. Because the only way we innovate, the only way we lead, is by being willing to say, this might not work. If you are not willing to say, this might not work, you cannot make art. Some people would say that Picasso was an extraordinarily talented artist. That he probably painted 10 or 20 or even 50 extraordinary paintings. Except that he painted 10,000 paintings during his career. And if he had been waiting for Guernica to come out before he started painting, he would have had a lot of trouble. Because that was painting number, I don't know, 2,842. <coughs> this notion that we have to be able to fail is critical. The guy who invented the ship also invented the shipwreck. <laughs> and yet, we check our blackberries, right? Even Don Draper. We check to make sure that everything is okay. They give it to you at work and they say, here, just like every once in a while, just check, make sure everything's okay back at the office. And then 10 minutes later, I wonder if everything's still, yep, everything's okay. And the next thing you know, the leader of the free world is sitting there staring at his thing. Is everything okay? No one has ever done creative work on blackberry. Because its only purpose is for us to check to make sure everyone <laughs> likes us. That that voice in your head, the heckler, the voice in the back of your head that says, I need to be liked by all. That I need to make sure that this does not lead to failure. It's the voice that says, you know, a crocodile might eat, you might fall off a cliff. A shark might fall on your house if you do this. <coughs> Nicholas Bate calls it the worst case scenario generator. Right? That you're looking at an opportunity and you make a list of all the things that could happen, and if one of them is the universe ends, then that's the one that we focus on. And so this voice in the back of our head <laughs> is constantly reminding us that it might not work, that we might fall because we flew too close to the sun. 